The Path to Salvation by St. Theophon the Recluse, Part 3. How the Christian life is lived, ripened, and fortified, and about the order of a God-pleasing life. Chapter 1. The Final Goal of Man, A Living Unity with God. Let us recall that the person who has just turned from darkness to light, from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God, he just entered a new path, on which he has not yet made a single step, but he burns with zeal to do everything necessary in order to establish himself in the work he has begun, and not to give in again to his former tyrants, who separated him from God and the Savior, dragging him to destruction. We might ask, where is he to go, and what should he do, in order to arrive where he should? and to arrive surely, directly, quickly, and successfully. The goal toward which the convert should direct all his attention and labors is the final goal of man and the economy of salvation, namely, pleasing God, a living unity with God, becoming worthy of his kingdom. The searching, zealous spirit will only be at peace when he attains God, tastes him, and is filled. Therefore, the first law for him is this. Seek ye the Lord and be strengthened. Seek ye his face at all times. The blessedness of this is incomprehensible to man. He himself could not even have conceived of such a height. But when it pleased God to give him this dignity, it was audacious for man to refuse it through his unbelief, inattentiveness, and neglect of it in his thoughts, even during his labors. I will dwell in them, says God, and this is all three persons of the Most Holy Trinity. The Lord says of God the Father and of himself, We will come unto him, to him who believes in him and loves him, and make our abode with him, and about himself alone. I will come in to him, and will sup with him, and even more clearly, I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. The Apostle says about the Holy Spirit, The Spirit of God dwells in you, or, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. We should note that God's indwelling is not merely mental, as sometimes happens during divine contemplation, to a man by God's good will, but it is a living, enlivening thing, to which contemplation should only be considered a means, mental and heartfelt longing for God, that has come by God's good will, prepares a person to truly receive God. It is a kind of unity in which, without eradicating human strength and personality, God manifests himself as one that worketh in him both to will and to do. And the person, according to the apostle, does not live, but Christ lives in him. This is not the person's only goal, but also the goal of God himself. All is created in God and endures in God. Free creatures are given over to their own volition, but not finally and not forever, so that they would give themselves to God, all-powerful, not making any particular kingdom of themselves independent of God's kingdom. It may seem strange that communion with God must be attained when it is already present, or is given through the sacrament of baptism or confession. For it is said, For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Or, for you are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Indeed, according to a simple understanding, God is everywhere that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. And he is ready to abide in any one who is ready to receive him. Only lack of desire, coarseness, and sinfulness keep us from him. Now that the penitent has renounced everything and given himself to God, what hinders God from dwelling in him? 1. Various Aspects of Communion with God To clear up such a perplexity, we must discriminate between the various aspects of communion with God. 
Communion begins at the moment of awakening. Man discovers it through searching and longing for God, and God reveals it through his good will, assistance and protection. But God is still outside of man, and man is outside of God, not commingling, and not freely mutually accepted. In the sacrament of baptism or confession, the Lord enters a man by his grace, is in live communion with him, and allows him to taste all the sweetness of divinity, so abundantly and perceptibly, as though it were essentially culminated in him. But then again he hides this manifestation of his communion, only renewing it from time to time, and at that only lightly, as if in a reflection and not in his original state. He leaves man in ignorance of himself and his dwelling in man until the man has reached a specific level of maturity or education, according to God's wise guidance. After this, the Lord perceptibly manifests his dwelling in the man's spirit, which has by then become a temple of the tri-hypostatic divinity filling him. Thus, there are three forms of communion with God. One is mental, which happens during the period of conversion, and the other two are actual, but one of them is hidden, invisible to others and unknown to us ourselves, while the other is obvious to us and to others. The first form of communion, the most understandable and common, does not cease during the second or even third stages, because spiritual life is mental life. However, in these stages it differs characteristically from its first quality, which is something impossible to explain in words. All spiritual life consists in the movement from mental communion with God to actual, live, perceptible, and manifest communion. 2. How Grace Settles in the Repentant Soul In looking at a person who has repented, we are looking at a person who has actually entered into communion with God, but this communion is still hidden, secret, unmanifest. His goal is to attain communion that is complete, tangible, and perceptible. We must precisely determine all of this for ourselves and be assured because all the penitents labor for salvation should be built upon this foundation, namely, that in the sacrament of confession, or baptism, grace descends perceptibly to the spirit, but then hides itself from the awareness, although it does not in fact go away. It remains imperceptible until the heart is purified, at which time it dwells visibly and finally. It is obvious that our only instructors in this matter can be the Holy Fathers. None of them expressed it so well as St. Didacus, Bishop of Photiki, and St. Macarius of Egypt. We present their witness to our suppositions. Grace settles in a person and stays with him from the moment he receives the mysteries. From the instant we are baptized, says St. Diodacos, grace is hidden in the depths of the intellect. Also, for when through holy baptism divine grace in its infinite love permeates the lineaments of God's image, thereby renewing in the soul the capacity for attaining the divine likeness, what place is there for the devil? St. Macarius says, Grace is constantly present, and is rooted in us, and worked into us like leaven. From our earliest years, until the thing thus present becomes fixed in a man like a natural endowment, as if it were one substance with him. When grace first settles in a person through a sacrament, it vouchsafes that person a complete taste of the blessedness of communion with God. If we fervently desire holiness, says St. Diadakos, the Holy Spirit, at the outset, gives the soul a full and conscious taste of God's sweetness, so that the intellect will know exactly of what the final reward of the spiritual life consists. Also, at the start of the spiritual way, the soul usually has the conscious experience of being illumined with its own light through the action of grace. This most perceptible illumination of grace 
is at first expressed by the white clothing that the newly baptized wear for seven days. That this is not just a formality is seen from the examples of the holy converts. For some were visibly clothed in light, upon others a dove descended, and the faces of others became bright. In general, all who have truly come close to the Lord have felt a certain leaping of spirit, similar to the leaping of the forerunner of the Lord in the womb of Elizabeth when the mother of God approached her carrying the Lord within her. In the lives of St. Simeon and John is written that they saw a light around a brother who was baptized and received the monastic habit, and it lasted seven days. Feeling a particular action of God upon receiving the monastic habit, they sought to preserve it forever, and immediately departed to a solitary place more suitable for that form of asceticism. Then grace hides itself from the one who is laboring for his salvation, and although it dwells and works in him, it does so unnoticeably to him, and he is so unaware of it that he often considers himself to be abandoned by God and perishing, which causes him to fall into constrictions, lamentations, and even light depression. Thus, St. Diadokos continues, From the foregoing citation, Incidentally, it hides the treasure of this life-creating gift for a long time, so that we would count ourselves as nothing, though we fulfill every virtue. For we have not yet made holy love habitual in ourselves. But as we continue our ascetic struggles, it produces in the theologizing soul its secret activity in a manner unknown by the soul, so that it might incline us who have been called at the first opportunity from the unknown to the known, to enter the way of divine visions, and secondly, so that amidst our ascetic labors we may preserve our knowledge from vainglory. In another place he explains how grace works in general. Grace at first conceals its presence in those who have been baptized, waiting to see which way the soul inclines. But when the whole man has turned toward the Lord, it then reveals to the heart its presence, there with a feeling which words cannot express, once again waiting to see which way the soul inclines. At the same time, however, it allows the arrows of the devil to wound the soul at the most inward point of its sensitivity, so as to make the soul search out God with warmer resolve and more humble disposition. And I am speaking here of the struggle that takes place when God recedes in order to educate us, then grace conceals itself a little, as I have said, but nevertheless supports the soul in a hidden way, so that in the eyes of its enemies the victory appears to be due to the soul alone. This brings great sadness, humility, and even some measure of despair to the soul. St. Macarius of Egypt also says, God's grace in man, which is already present, already granted, and the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is vouchsafed to a faithful soul, proceeds with much contention, with much endurance and long-suffering, and temptations and trials. This refers, of course, not to the first time grace is received, but its complete indwelling and activity. As we can see from his own words, where he says that the spiritual influence of God's grace within the soul works with great patience, wisdom, and mysterious management of the mind, while the man for long times and seasons contends in much endurance, and then the work of grace is proved to be perfect in him. He explains this using the examples of Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, and David, who, having received great promises, were made to suffer a long time in unknowing until they finally saw the fulfillment of the promise. It is necessary to note that this hiddenness and imperceptibility is not all encompassing, but is sometimes mixed with consolations, although these consolations are something entirely different from those which occur with the indwelling of the Spirit. Finally, God dwells in man in a special manner. Finally, when this period of hidden communion with God and his mysterious activity in the soul is over, the duration of this period not being in man's hands, 
but in the guiding wisdom of man's saving grace. God dwells in man in a special manner. He visibly fills him, unites himself to him, and communes with him. This is the goal man strives to achieve through all his ascetic struggles and labors, all the economy of salvation from God himself, and all that happens to each person in the present life from birth to the grave. St. Macarius writes that the work of grace after long trials finally shows itself fully, and the soul acquires full sonship of the Spirit. God himself proves the heart, and man is made worthy to be of one spirit with the Lord. According to St. Diodocus, if a man, while still alive, can undergo death through his labors, then in his entirety he becomes the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Grace illuminates his whole being with a deeper awareness, warming him with great love of God. This action reveals itself or is accompanied by different manifestations with different people. Two Ways of Communing with God These two ways of actually communing with God were beautifully described by the wise Sirach. Speaking of wisdom, which is the very grace of God which saves us? For at the first she will walk with him by crooked ways, and bring fear and dread upon him, and torment him with her discipline until she may trust his soul and try him by her laws. Then she will return the straight way unto him and comfort him and show him her secrets. For at first she will walk with him by crooked ways, that is, austerely, strictly, unmercifully, with a seeming lack of love, and bring fear and dread upon him, for the fear of God's abandonment and the ever imminent threat of attack from vicious enemies. According to St. Diodocus, grace acts like a mother who hides from her children, so that from fear they would begin to cry and seek her, especially when they see strange faces before them, and torment him with her discipline. It will keep him a long time in this period of hidden and severe instruction. According to St. Macarius, grace in many and various ways, as it wills and corresponds to the person's needs, orders everything for him, keeps him in many temptations and mysterious trials of the mind, and so on, until she may trust his soul and try him by her laws. That is, grace leads him to the point where he can be relied upon completely as one tried and true. St. Macarius says that when after many temptations the will has come to please the Holy Spirit, and over a long period of time has shown itself to be patient and unwavering in this, when the soul does not offend the Spirit in any way, but is cooperative with grace in all commandments, then will she return the straight way unto him, that is, openly, face to face appear to him as if after a separation. Then, according to St. Macarius, the work of grace is proved to be perfect in him. He acquires full sonship. Or, according to St. Diodocus, grace illumines his whole existence with some kind of deep feeling, and he becomes entirely the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, the light of God's face. Our Lord and God comes and makes his abode with him, and comfort him, and your heart shall rejoice, says the Lord. And your joy no man takes from you. The kingdom of God is joy in the Holy Spirit. The light that shines in man, says St. Macarius, so penetrates all the inward parts of a man that he, immersed in this sweet and pleasant feeling, is totally outside himself because of the superabundance of love and the hidden mysteries that he himself now sees. St. Diodocus says that the soul then flames and yearns with an indescribable kind of joy and love to leave the body and depart to the Lord, and as if forget this temporary life, and shew him her secrets, the secrets of divine wisdom, the trinity worthy of worship, the economy of salvation, the acquisition of salvation, the secret of sin and virtue, providence for creatures rational and material, and, in general, 
the whole divine order of things, as described in great detail by St. Isaac the Syrian in his epistle to St. Simeon. When the intellect is renewed and the heart is sanctified, his intellect perceives the spiritual knowledge of created things, and the divine vision of the mysteries of the Holy Trinity together with the mysteries of the worshipful economy on our behalf shines forth in him. Then he becomes one through the completeness of the knowledge of the hope of future things. For if the intellect, which beholds hidden spiritual mysteries, is in its natural state of health, it distinctly beholds the glory of Christ. It does not question or receive instruction, but more than in the freedom of the will, it delights in the sweetness of the mysteries of the new world. Such perfect knowledge comes with the receiving of the Spirit, which leads our spirit into that world, or realm, of contemplation. The Holy Spirit takes the covering away from the soul, transports his soul to the future age, and shows it everything wondrous. Thus it is now clear that the grace that comes to the convert through the sacraments unites with him, and gives him at first a taste of all the sweetness of life in God, and then hides its presence from him, leaving him to act on his own in labors, sweat, perplexities, and even falls. Finally, after this period of trial is over, it abides in him obviously, actively, powerfully, and perceptibly.